Tonight's guest wishes to remain anonymous. With that in mind, I'm just going to call him Wayne. Wayne, welcome to the show. I appreciate you for having me. Well, thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate your time. Wayne, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I'm 21 years old. I've lived in the same town my whole life. I've been an outdoorsman since I was very, very young. My father, he would carry me into the woods in a backpack since I was three months old. So there's not many things in my county that I've not seen, heard, or experienced in one way or another. It sounds like it if you got that early of a start. Wayne, before we start talking about your encounters, there's something I wanted to ask you about. Earlier this week, you suffered a big loss. Please tell the listeners what I'm referring to. On Monday at 11 o'clock, my oldest dog, which was the last one that I raised with my father before he had passed, and the last one I raised with my mom before I moved out and started my own life on my own, I had to let her go and put her down because she was eat up with cancer. I chose for it to happen because of how good of a dog she had been and how much she had helped me. And it was it was a hard decision, but I didn't want to see her suffering no more. Her name was Kipper. She was 14 years old. She was a Jack Russell Feist mix. The most beautiful dog I've ever seen. So she was 14. Well, I'm so glad to hear that she lived such a long, full life. That's great. I'm so sorry, like I said, though, to hear that you had to euthanize her like that. But it's not easy. I've been there before more times than I can count. And yeah, it's not easy. It's not fun. You grew up really close to the land between the lakes. How close did you grow up to there, though? I could go out my front door and be to the land between the lakes within 15 minutes. Ooh, close. Yeah, that's really close. Did you spend much time there as a kid? Uh, Yes, I did. I spent a lot of my time there. I spent probably, I'd say out of my 21 years of my life, I spent a good 50 to 60% of my time in just land between the lakes alone. That's not including the other woods and outdoors that I've went and learned the land and hunted, trapped. Land Between the Lakes was a big part of my life. It was everything to me. It's where I felt most at home. It's uh, it's where my family had land back before the government bought it out and flooded the rivers, creating Land Between the Lakes. It was my safe space. No matter what was going on at any age, I knew I could go out there and I'd be safe. That I could really go out there for several days at a time and nothing could bother me. That sure is a great way to grow up. Yeah, I'm so glad you're able to go out there and do all that, spend all the time out in the park. For the listeners who don't know what the LBL is and the reputation it has for being a dangerous place, please educate them. Well, Land Between the Lakes is a national park that it used to be uh, places called Tharp. It was broken into small communities. It is very well known for the dogman creature or Bigfoot and a lot of other cryptids that are just one-off or two-off stories. But... As big as that place is, I wouldn't doubt a word of what people have seen out there. The reason why it is so dangerous is because there's a uh, murder or more of a massacre that took place back in the 60s or 70s, if I'm recalling right. And it was a entire family that was massacred by an unknown creature. The father and son were found outside the camper. And had been mauled almost to the point of being unrecognizable. The mother was found inside the camper and she was 
tore up just as bad. And the little girl was missing. They found her several hours later when they launched a search for her up in a tree where something had been eaten on her. And then every year during hunting season, it never fails that someone or multiple people will go missing. Yeah, that's a pretty ominous place. You just mentioned the murders that apparently happened there. Do you know where they happened? Personally, I do not know where they happened. I know they are, I believe on the stories I was told, on the Kentucky side of Land Between the Lakes, because there's a Tennessee side and a Kentucky side. On the Kentucky side is where I was told it happened. But with the area I grew up in, I also heard a bunch of the stories growing up that happened on the Tennessee side. And if the stories that I was told growing up are true, then my grandfather took me to the site when I was probably around eight or nine years old. There's still a lot of debate on where the site is because a lot of the paperwork and all that has disappeared over the years. Imagine that. From what I understand, your dad gave you an ominous warning when you were small. What did he tell you? He told me, be in the house before dark. Do not stay out after dark. And to generally don't go far away from the house unless you know you can be back by dark. He had told me that since I was could walk. He told me that all the way up until he passed. He was very persistent on it. Don't go out after dark. Don't go investigate any noises you hear in the dark. Don't shoot at whatever's making the noises. Because he knew how I was, you know, 16-year-old hothead carrying a 12-gauge. Something scares me, I'm going to send lead at it. But he made it very, very clear that whatever it is, do not pull the trigger on it. Wow, that is pretty ominous. Before we move on, if you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, either way is fine, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. All right, Wayne, please tell us about your encounters now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. All right. Well, my first encounter, the lead up to it, is... It started happening around right around the first of fall. Leaves starting to change. Animals are starting to move a whole lot more. And during fall, me and a bunch of my friends, we'd always come over to our little piece of land that we had. And I would throw parties and get out there and have a fun time with them. Well, I had came up with a game where I would put on my ghillie suit that I used for turkey hunting, I would send them out into the woods and be like a game of cat and mouse. I had to touch them without them seeing me. And I had to not be seen by them if I wanted to win. We played it several times before we started hearing this creature. We probably played it three or four times. And each time as it got later into fall, more towards hunting season, they kept on getting the feeling that they was being watched. I told them it was just me until I started getting the feeling I was being watched and I was right there on top of the whole group. And probably one of the last parties I had right before rifle season opened up because we'd heard it a couple, what I'm about to describe a couple times before and it was close enough that it had made to where I, I didn't want to go in the woods without a rifle. But we was playing one night, and they was in the center of the field that had a slight incline to it. And it had a sawgrass growing in it, pretty tall sawgrass. So I could crawl up through it pretty easily. I was right on top of them about to tag one of them without them even seeing me. When we heard the most blood curdling scream kind of mixed 
with a howl that had so much bass to it, you could feel it rattling in your chest from a, about a ho- two hollers over. We decided to get out of there. And really, we didn't go back to that part of the land at all anymore. We didn't go back there during bow season, the ending stages of bow season. We didn't go during the uh, muzzle loading season. We wanted to go, or I wanted to go. They all had land in the neighboring counties or up in Kentucky they could hunt. I wanted to go during rifle season. And I had this one particular spot that produced for me every single year. It always get me a decent buck or enough does to fill the freezer. If I wasn't hunting for horn, I'd hunt for meat. That's how I was raised. But this certain field, the way I'm going to describe it to you is it's got a thicket that was to the right of me, a long field that stretched out probably around 300 yards directly in front of me. The uh, field was probably about 50 yards across from thicket to thicket. And the thicket to my right was just a bunch of small saplings, briar brushes, and just general stuff that you would not want to go through. No man would want to go through it unless he had a machete or something to cut a path. That is the area that I always hunted. And it was out of a tripod. And this tripod was a little bit taller than once and the rest of the ones in the area. It was closer to 20 feet, 20 to 30 feet off the ground instead of, you know, the 10 to 12, like most tripods that are in Tennessee. It was more like the ones you see in Texas. But I waited until the first day of rifle season. I didn't go that morning. Because I had heard it, heard whatever this creature was at the time until I saw it and figured out what it was. I had heard it all morning in the area where I wanted to hunt. I heard it screaming. And that's the best way I know to describe it to you is a scream. But I had heard it all morning coming from that area. And I decided to wait until evening a couple of hours after it had uh, stopped making any noise and I couldn't hear it no more. And if I did, it was a couple of hollers over and I figured, you know, I'd be safe. Now, during rifle season, I carried my Remington 270 bolt action. It had a high powered scope. It always done me good. It was my father's rifle before he passed. And when he passed it, came to me I also carried his 44 magnum because we had had hogs in the area and I know how aggressive they can be because I've seen some of my friends get charged I've been charged by one and you need something with a pretty stout round to stop that thing in its tracks but I had waited till probably about two thirty, three o'clock that day to hit the woods. Now, I was 17 at the time. I just got my license. And I had decided to uh, go to this area that I always produced for me. I had uh, gotten there and I walked in plenty of daylight, but I'd noticed how quiet the woods were. Most of the time when I went to that place, if I took a twenty two, I could have killed my limit of squirrels in just a few minutes. I was so used to hearing a squirrel bark or birds chirping or something walking in there. And I'd noticed how extremely quiet it was. It was the most eerie quiet you could imagine. It was like someone just hit the mute button on the woods. But I had, uh, I'd gotten into my tripod and gotten set up. I just started 
doing my normal thing of doing a little preview of the area to see if there's been any new any new deer trails come through, any new game trails, anything. And there was nothing. It looked like that whole area of the woods was dead. Like, not even the bugs were making any noise. And for anybody that hunts during late fall, they know how bad the bugs can be for early rifle season, and especially in Tennessee where it still can get pretty warm during the day. But I was sitting there. I ain't seen nothing all evening. Not, when I say the woods are dead, the woods are dead. There's nothing moving, nothing going on. I'm sitting there, and it's getting towards end of the legal shooting light. And anybody knows that? That's your prime time. That's your prime time for deer. It's the last 30 minutes of daylight. So I'm sitting there, and I hear some noise start coming from the thicket to my right. There was, oh, it's probably about 100 to 200 yards off when I start hearing it. Because the thicket, is like I described it, you know, just briar patches and small saplings all the way through. All the way to the bottom of the holler. It's like that. And um, I hear it start coming on, coming closer and closer and closer. So I get my rifle up. I got trained on that area. Of where I think it's going to come out. I wait for maybe another 10 minutes or so. You know, I, all, this all happened in a matter of 15, 20 minutes. But I hear it go from, you know, maybe 200 yards to 100 yards to 50 yards away from me in that thicket. And once it got probably 75 to 50 yards away, and I, I could see the top of those small saplings just start whipping back and forth as it moves through it. it I thought it was a hog, to be honest. I thought it was one of the biggest hogs of the county when I saw that. So I got trained on the area. And right before it would have entered the field, it stopped. Just completely dead stopped. There was no more sound, no more movement. And it just seemed like it disappeared. And then within probably 20 to 30 seconds of it, just no movement, no nothing. I could start to see something entering the field. It was low crawling it looked like a man low crawling like they're doing the army crawl but it didn't look natural it didn't look like this thing should be doing this and as soon as it entered the field i could see a just ginormous canine head like the head was way bigger for the body than what it should have been I just remember seeing the pointed ears, the snout, long black body following it. And it had like the hawks of a dog, if you know what I'm talking about. And I sat there and watched it enter the field. It probably got about 15 yards into the field. If that, and I could see it, like, I believe every animal and every human being has a sixth sense that tells you when you're being watched. I believe every creature on this earth has that feeling. And I don't know if it felt me watching it. Because by that time, I'd already had my scope trained on it. I had my safety off. 
and I have my finger on the trigger. It cut its head directly towards me, and I could see them amberish yellow eyes. And they weren't looking in my direction. And these eyes were huge. I mean, they they was bigger than any animal eye shine that I've ever seen in that county. I could see its eyes looking at me, not just anywhere at me, at my eyes. It knew I was there. It knew exactly what I was. And it was looking me dead in the eyes. He knew, it knew where I was. This thing, while still holding eye contact with me, started to push up off the ground. And I could see when it started pushing off, off the ground, the paws or hands or whatever you want to say it had. But I could see the extremely long claws coming off of it. If I had to estimate, they was maybe three to four inches long. But whenever he, I don't know what he did, because I, I remember seeing this through the scope, because I, I never took him out of my scope until he was long gone. Whenever he pushed up off the ground, and I could start to hear his joints pop when he got up on two legs, he must have clenched his hands or his paws or whatever he's got. And I could see the claws just cut through the dirt like razor blades it looked like they had no problem going through that and the dirt on the piece of area i was hunting because I, I can tell you this from me tilling the land for deer plots and stuff like that that ground's pretty hard it, it takes a decently weighted down plow to get through that ground and this thing went through it like it was nothing He got up on the two legs, still holding eye contact with me. He lit out one of those screams. And as close as he was, it I thought he rattled my chest the first time we heard him when he scared us, scared me and my friends out of hunting during bow season on that area. He rattled my chest, like to the point where I couldn't focus. Uh, and it was almost like it put me in a state of shock. When it when I say it rattled your chest, dude, I'm a Civil War reenactor. And for anyone who has ever been to one, to anyone who has ever been around any sort of big gun next to it when it fires, that thud in your chest, it was like two of them at the same time. And after he lit out that screen, he took off on two legs back to my right into that thicket. And I could see him pushing the saplings back and forth as he went, but he was in a dead sprint. And no man and no nothing on two legs should be able to go through that area like that. When... I gave him probably another five minutes, five to ten minutes till I last heard him break something on his way out. I climbed down out of my tripod. Now, on the way down, I was thinking only the worst possibilities of what could have happened. I was thinking, you know, if when he screamed, if I pulled that trigger, would I had had enough time to rack my the bolt on my rifle? and get another shell back into the barrel and ready to fire before he was over here and it knocked me out of my tripod because my tripod was only secured to the ground with metal rebar that we had bent and nailed into the ground. You know, I've pushed it over on accident just leaning against it because the dirt where the tripod was sitting was more moss because it was right next to a big tree. We never hit any of the roots or nothing on the tree. It was loose dirt. But 
I climbed down and I had started walking out. I had my rifle at the low ready. I had my phone flashlight on because I'd forgotten my head torch. I had my phone's flashlight on and I had it extended on the stock because I'm I'm a lefty, so my right hand had my phone as well as the stock of my rifle, and I had my rifle at the low ready. Any sound I heard, I'd automatically snap to it, and I was ready to send, send lead. I'd probably gotten halfway back to my vehicle, which it was just a little Chevy truck, was good for me at the time. The land that I was hunting was my family's land and we're we was backed up to lbl the neighboring property those people had a house and they also hunted the land they heard this creature scream and they came booking it over there to check on me i could see their head their headlamps coming through the field Right around the time I got halfway back to my truck. They asked me what it was. And if I was okay. And, you know, did I fall? Because they thought it was me. They thought it was me that it fell out of the tripod or that I would cut myself, shot myself, something. I had them escort me back to my vehicle. And I was trying to explain to them along the way what I had seen and they kept on saying oh no it was just a coyote it's it's uh, someone that dropped a dog it's just one of those dogs it's um, a wolf even though wolves ain't native to here it's a uh, bobcat that you heard and you just imagine the rest I, I heard every bit of it trying to write off what I saw Except for one of them, because it was three of them that came checked on me. Because it was a grandfather, a father, and a son that came and checked on me. They escort me back to my truck. And we had gotten there, and the father and the son was trying to write me off. The grandfather, he was looking at me like, yeah, you've seen it. His eyes was big as saucers. He he never he said it without saying it is the best way I can put it. He said, "Yeah, you've seen it. I know what you're talking about." And then I'd gotten back to my truck. You know, we'd all all unloaded our rifles once we hit my vehicle. I offered them a ride back to wherever they either had their vehicles or where they where they want me to take them all the way back to the house. I'd offered them that because they said they was getting ready to walk back to theirs. And I told them no. I told them, you know, no. There's something in these woods that y'all don't know what it is and that y'all need to be worried about. So I made them get in the vehicle with me. And uh, I got them back back to their vehicle safely. And then I went back home. I laid in bed. I kept on thinking, you know, what if this thing's followed me? I kept on having nightmares at night of those eyes because those eyes still haunt me to this day. But I'd gotten back to my, my family's house at that time. And it's, you know, just a little single, not even single wide, it's a trailer. And where we had it, it's on a downhill incline. We had it split up. One half of the trailer was mine. One half of the trailer was my mom's. Well, my mom and dad's, but my mom was the only one living. So we uh, we had it split. I had the side that was higher up off the ground. My side was probably eight to nine foot off the ground. 
because of the incline, we had to put blocks underneath the trailer to make it level. But my, my bedroom window was probably eight to nine foot off the ground. And it probably, of course, let me, let me back up by saying this. After that night, I didn't go out there very much. I did a few times, and I, I took out every, every gun I had at my disposal and made sure they was loaded. I had went and, you know, I go check out the land. I'd find kill sites, and these kill sites were something to see. And they was white-tailed deer, wild hogs, coyotes, and I've seen animals kill sites before, but these hit me as strange in the way that they was done. Because you know, a bobcat's gonna go for the neck. A pack of coyotes is going to go for the heels and then the neck, or they'll just eat, it, eat the animal while it's still alive. These kill sites were a whole different beast, if you will. They were mangled. I, I found most of the white-tailed deer kill sites that I had found, the head was completely gone. It was probably 20, 30 feet away. I found the the couple of wild hogs I found. I only found one or two that had their heads missing. Because it takes a lot to take a hog's head off. And then the coyotes. I'd find whole packs. Whether it be at their den or out in a field. Just massacred. And I, when I say massacred, their intestines were hanging out, legs ripped off, heads twisted around backwards, heads completely took off. One of the deer kills that I found, like I said, it was missing their head, but the thing that hit me as extremely odd was one of its legs was missing and it wasn't cut off it was pulled off and it seemed like in one fell swoop because you could literally see where the muscle had been ripped apart it wasn't it wasn't no butcher cut or it wasn't cut like a knife would do. It wasn't cut like any claw would, would do. It was forcibly ripped off. And you could see where the muscle tendons snapped when they was pulled so far. And, uh, you know, I'm probably after my experience at the tripod, it's probably about a week of nonstop nightmares that I'd wake up and see them yellow. Those eyes, the best way I can describe is the eyes, because the color to me is hard to explain, but they had a yellowish tint to them, and that's the best way I know how to describe it, is a yellowish tint, eyes, looking in my window. Well, one night, I was there at the house by myself because my mom she was a sitter. She would sit with the elderly and she'd be gone from about the time I get home from school to around four to five in the morning, maybe even later. But I was home alone one night, probably about a week later after my tripod experience. And I got the feeling I was being watched again. And I was in my bedroom. And like I said, my bedroom window is probably eight to nine foot off the ground. 
forgot what I was doing. I think I was sitting there playing my PlayStation or something. But I look over my shoulder and I see them eyes just peering at me through my window. Of course, I freak out. And I went to the center of the trailer because it had no windows. The only two sides of the trailer that had windows was my room, the little guest room that was on my side of the trailer, and then in my mom's room. There was none in the living room. And the living room was set up as coming from my side of the trailer. It was the living room, my dad's gun cabinet, which had become mine at that time, and then the kitchen. And the kitchen had one right above the sink. I had a uh, window right above the sink. So I went in there and all three, I had three dogs at the time. A Jack Russell, his name was Pistol. You know, he he had little dog syndrome. You know, he thinks he's 10 foot tall and bulletproof. Ain't nothing going to hurt him. Ain't nothing going to stop him. And he can tear up anything. We had uh, Sugar. She was a feist. And then we had Kipper. She was the combination of the two. And Pistol and Kipper had little dog syndrome. Like like I explained, they think they're 10 foot tall and bulletproof. And all three of the dogs was hiding under the couch. So once I went in there, I went to my gun cabinet. I'd gotten all the guns out. I had my 270, my 12 gauge, which was loaded with buckshot, a uh, my dad's 44 Magnum, a MP5 that was in 22 caliber. I can't remember the exact model name right now. Saved my life, but the best way I described it, it looks like an MP5, but it's 22 caliber and it had a 30 round clip that was full. And it had a red dot. So I was sitting there on the couch and I could halfway hear it circling the, the trailer. But once I'd sat in the living room, Pistol, the Jack Russell, he came out from my couch and got up there beside me. And I could tell wherever this thing was because he would turn his head or orient his body so he could know where it was and this went on for a good little while every now and then I could hear it probably every 15-20 minutes I could hear it either brush up against the house or if it was by a window sit there and almost like it was tapping on the side of it trying to draw me to it and of course you know 17 years old you're seeing something you don't know what it is you don't know what's capable of You've seen it once before. You see how fast it can move. You know your dad's warnings of being in the house before dark. And you found kill sites of something that you can't explain. So you're sitting at that time. I was sitting there thinking, okay, do not go towards that window. Because if it snatches you at that window, it's more than likely going to rip you to pieces, come in and kill the dogs and probably be waiting on your mom when she gets home from work. So I sat there and it, it, I forgot how long it circled that, that house. I mean, I, I sat up for a good little while, even after it left. And, um, uh, I never really wanted to be run off that place. But once my mom had come home, she could tell something was up. I told her what was up, and it wasn't too long after that that we was moved. We had left that land. We'd moved to the center of Dover, and we just wanted to be left alone. We didn't want nothing to do with this creature. And other than those two on that land, I've only had one other encounter with this, and it's nowhere near as blood pumping or heart racing or adrenaline 
driven, but I was 18 at this time. So probably about five, six months had passed. I went and picked up two of my best friends. Now, two of my best friends, well, at that point, I was still in high school. You know, I'd been best friends with these two girls for a very long time. And they wanted to go right through LBL. So I picked them up. Neither one of them are from around here. So they wanted to know, you know, is there any spooky stories from here or any myths, legend, cryptid, stuff like that? Because they was very big into that. They loved exploring abandoned places. They loved the spiritual, the paranormal, cryptids and stuff like that. They was eat up with it. I told them about the murders and the people going missing and especially the legend of the beast of LBL, which is the one that people credit with the family being murdered that I told you about that I'd mentioned at the beginning of this recording. They wanted to know more about it. You know, have I ever seen it? Stuff like that. And I, I just kind of push it off because I didn't want to tell them what I'd seen, but they wanted to go to the Kentucky side of Land Between Lakes because they wanted to go to a place called Hotel California. They wanted to go there. I want to take them to the Elk and Bison Prairie, if I'm being honest with you. But we had gotten probably about halfway there, and we noticed it was starting to get later in the day, and I didn't want them to be out there at night for multiple reasons. So I knew – LBO and pretty good. So I took a road that uh, would circle us close to the Kentucky side of LBL and then lead us back down through some back roads back into our little town. I was telling them the story about it again because they wanted to know all they could about it. So we was going, I just finished the story and I started getting that just got off feeling of something ain't right. I feel like I'm being watched again. So I look in my rear view mirrors and it's sun's going down, but it's still plenty daylight to see. I look directly back. And crossing the road is a very big, a very strong looking creature with a canine head on two legs, pointed ears, the eyes, and it's going across the road behind my vehicle. And I step on it. I go from probably going around 40 down the back roads to going 60 to 70. And they think I'm just trying to show off and, you know, mess with them like I normally did. And, you know, we're sitting there laughing, cutting, joking, and joking. And they ask me because they see my face and it's just ain't straight in. I'm sitting there still trying to laugh with them. They say, okay, what did you see? Something ain't right. What's going on? And uh, I didn't tell him. We get to the town, and I ask, "Okay, what's up? We're not stupid. You're our best friend, so tell us." So eventually, I, I crack and tell him. I told him, "You remember that story about the family got murdered by that creature?" I'm pretty sure I just saw the portrayer. And of course, with them being eat up with the paranormal and cryptid hunting and all that, they wanted me to turn around to go see if there's any tracks or anything like that. And I told them, no, I'm not going back. And then I told them my experiences I had before. I told them, look, there's nothing y'all can do to make me go back. Well, we went back into town and... I dropped them off. Of course, they was still a little bummed. And I went back home. 
And other than hearing the screams every now and then when I go to LBL, that was the last time I had an encounter where I saw it. But till part till the day I die, when it gets real late at night, if I can't sleep and I'm out on my porch, I'm probably always going to think of them eyes, especially when it gets quiet. I'm probably always going to think of them eyes and start thinking when it gets quiet, where the eyes going to pop up now. It's really a shame that you had to deal with all three of those. That's horrible. My granddad and my dad, they always told me that each man's got to get his fair share. So I guess they must have had something for me to get that as my fair share. Well, I'd say you had more than your fair share. Yeah, that's not good. When you were sitting there listening to those screams slash howls it was making, did you ever think about getting out of there while it was doing that? Because if you did, you'd be able to monitor where it was at. No, not really. If you're talking about the first time we heard it, me and my friend group, we just focused on trying to get out of there. If you're referring to when I saw it from the tripod, I waited till it was clean out of earshot before I even considered getting down out of that tripod. Yeah, I was talking about the first time. Then, yeah, me and my friends, we was just more concerned about getting out of there because we had a group of girls and they was afraid and you know we didn't have no weaponry so we just decided the best option was to get out of there it sounded like you waited a little bit before you got out of there instead of as soon as you started hearing those sounds getting out of there while you could tell okay it's over there it's at a distance i don't like what i'm hearing but it's over there so if we get out of here now we can monitor it that wasn't exactly our thought process our thought process probably went more of, okay, it's two hollers over. We don't want to find out if it's going to come any closer. So let's get these girls out of here. Let's get back to the house where we've got weaponry. You know, because my my friend group, they was all good old boys and their girlfriends or some of the girls I grew up knowing in school. So all of our mindsets was it's about two hollers over. I really don't like the way it sounds. So let's start getting back towards the house. Yeah, I don't think anyone could blame you for doing that. After hearing what you did that day, how could you ever go back into the woods and hunt? Because it it it's kind of bred into me. The past three generations of my family was loggers and big outdoorsmen. My dad, like I said, he He had me in the woods by the time I was three months old in a backpack. From the time I can remember, he was getting me ready for my first hunt. And something that you've learned to do your whole life and been taught by someone who's no longer there, you not only want to honor their memory of what they taught you, but it's also hard to give up something you've known your whole life. That's that's the way I saw it is, okay, this thing's over here. I'm going to go to the opposite side of the county to hunt. Well, now I hunt the opposite side of the county. During that time, it was more of, okay, maybe it's passing through. Maybe it's something like that. Maybe it's just something passing through. Maybe it's something that's going to be, you know, challenging at the time. Because, you know, like I said, I was... I was hot-headed in my teenage years. I I had no problem going and getting in a fight. I had no problem facing anything head on. But th- that's why that night it sat there and circled the house. If it made any attempts to look through any window I saw or come through any door that I had view on, I was going to unleash every bullet I had. Well, it goes without saying, I'm so glad it never came to that. When that dog man came into view in that field that day, did you ever think it was someone trying to prank you? No, that never came into mind. 
because I saw the back legs. They was like the back legs of a dog. <laughs> Nobody in this small town is going to have the money or the stupidity to come out into the woods with a Hollywood grade werewolf costume. I mean, if if you did either one of them around here, people just soon shoot you to figure out what you are than for them to give you any kind of warning. Yeah, that would be a pretty stupid thing to do when you know people are out hunting. No, I agree. After he seemingly left the area and you started heading for your truck, was that the longest walk of your life? Oh, yeah. Every step seemed like 100 yards. Every 100 yards seemed like 10 miles. And until I got back there, it seemed like I'd walked probably close to 100 miles or more. It seemed like it, but I knew it was just a mile back to my vehicle. Yeah, I'll bet it did seem like it took forever. The night you saw looking at you through the window, was it making any noise? It was making a real deep guttural growl. Like, almost like it had something stuck in its throat growl. And every now and then I could hear when it'd get real close because you know how a trailer is. The walls are thin. Whenever it would get right behind where the couch was I was sitting on with my dogs and my guns, I could almost hear it like panting. And it was like a dog's pant. And when a dog pants, sometimes they're also testing there. So I don't know whether he was trying to pinpoint where I was in the trailer or whether he was just getting a breath. Wow, it really is a shame you had to deal with those experiences. That's horrible. When you saw that big dog man cross the road behind you that night, was that like opening up an old wound for you or did that not really affect your ability to deal with your prior encounters? Oh yeah, it was like someone just... (laughs) If you're comparing it to a wound, it was like someone ripping open the stitches and pouring lemon and salt into the wound. Because at that point, I'd started getting my nightmares under control. and I'd started getting my uh, hypervigilance down. And from that point, for about another couple months, all that was shot. I was always hypervigilant. I was always having nightmares of seeing them eyes in the night or that thing grabbing me through the window. It was like it'd take me back to the trailer in my dreams. I could just imagine that thing's arm coming in the window and just snatching me out of my bed. Yeah, that's what I figured. I can only imagine how much of a setback that was. It set me back a couple months. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it did. You told us about the howl scream you heard. Have you heard any recordings that sound similar to what you heard that day? Yeah. Actually, on your website, when I submitted my, my sighting, that clip of a howl it was like that if not a little bit more high pitch i don't know whether this one was younger or whether it's depending on where they're from or whether he's just wanting a higher pitch screen but it was similar to that one on your website if anyone listening wants to listen to the vocalization that he's talking about if you go to dogmanencounters.com and visit the about dogman page you'll be able to listen to it your grandpa told you stories about dogmen, from what I understand. What more can you tell us about the stories he told you? Yeah, from an early age, me and my grandfather, we was always close. And you know how m- most grandfathers are. They'll tell you stories of when they was young and growing up and the stories they heard from their grandfathers. Well, he was born 1943, you know, middle World War II. He grew up in a small town, never completed schooling, worked in the logging industry pretty much his whole life, same as his father and same as my father. But he would tell me stories, and out of maybe every hundred or so stories he'd tell me, maybe one to two would relate to Dogman. And one of the ones that always stuck to me a lot was of how one of the communities in LBL before it was LBL banded together to try to run this thing out of there because it had been taking livestock, 
attacking homesteads, scratching up cabins real bad. And the creature was creating utter mayhem and how the community banded together to run it out of the area. He was the one that initially told me about the murders of the family that took place out there. And he's the one that uh, also told me about a couple of the stories that happened on the Kentucky side at a place called Hotel California. I can only imagine the stories he told you. Oh, trust me. If if I could get him on here, he could probably keep every one of your listeners entertained for hours on end, whether it retained a dogman or not. Oh, I believe it. Yeah, I don't doubt that. Well, Wayne, it's about time for us to call it. Before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Yeah. Um, like I said, I'm 21 years old right now. It took me a lot of courage to come forward and talk about this thing finally. To everybody that's out there, if you've seen one, please talk to somebody about it, someone you trust. And if there's nobody in your life that you think would believe you, make a report. Because on a 30-minute phone call, you have helped me more than me sitting there and trying to erase it out of my mind. That these things are real. These things I do believe are dangerous. But I don't, I don't think that their first intentions are going to be to kill you. Like you explained to me on our phone call, a lot of them just have a Grinch syndrome that they just want to get a reaction out of you, that they just want to scare you. That's right. Yeah, it really is a shame how they try to do that to terrify so many eyewitnesses. But yeah, for the most part, that's their M.O. And also, I'm so glad to hear that our conversation paid off and it helped you so much. That's great. And that's why I do this. But having said that, thank you so much for coming on and sharing those experiences with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And thank you for letting me share. You know, you're welcome. Thanks again so much. Have a great night.